Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Today, we're going to talk about carpal tunnel syndrome, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, a little bit of shoulder stuff, um, you know, but just a little bl blast from the past. And this was what I put on the front slide about three weeks ago. And it's a quote by Ian Watson. This quote's several years old, but it's still, I think, let me know if you think it's pertinent today. If you have to be persuaded, reminded, pressured, lied to, incentivized, coerced, bullied, socially shamed, guilt tripped, threatened, punished, and criminalized, if all of this is considered necessary to gain your compliance, you can be absolutely certain that what is being promoted is not in your best interest. Don't know how that pertains to society, but it does. Okay, now, all of this stuff, I really appreciate if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the Facebook channel, and those of you that have subscribed to Dr. BVIP, because a lot of this information, we're dividing the health talk into two portions. One, I think, will get by the Ministry of Truth. Anyone familiar with 1984, that book? Okay, what was the Ministry of Truth responsible for? Lies. Okay, so hopefully this will get by the Ministry of Truth. That would be nice. Um, but thank you for all those that are supporting, because Victor, as nice as he is, he does not work for free. And then the Extreme Health Academy. Now, we were just, um, they cut out about 800 of our videos on Vimeo last week. Um, we've got them stored. They're going to be on the site. There's a lot of other ways that we can get our information out. But Extreme Health Academy is another one. If you want to get like-minded people and hang out, that's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal group. And I do a, about a two and a half hour webinar every month. Now, this is pertinent. Um, there's, there's a lot of people out there suggesting that a forced medical procedure without informed consent um, to keep a job. And then if you don't get the shot, then you don't qualify for unemployment. Some people think that's unfair. Okay. Now, um, this red balloon dot work site, I totally encourage you to do it, particularly the 9,000 workers in New York that have just been um, let go because they want to make their own health decisions. <laughs> oh, God. I know it's crazy. You know, just submit or, you know, stop thinking for yourselves. But the red balloon dot work, we're actually looking for two doctors of chiropractic and two front staff. And it's really hard to find people of like minded that have free businesses, that have free thoughts, that want you to work. So let's look at this. Carpal tunnel syndrome, everything comes out of the neck. When you look at like shoulder, elbow, and wrist, everything extends from this brachial plexus. Now, if you look at the rib cage area, the top two bones, the, the, the ribs, they look like bullhorns. And there's a small opening there, and it's the outlet to the thoracic or thoracic outlet. So if that heads forward off to the side, or if there's a shift in the rib cage area, you're gonna, you can compromise the blood supply or nerve supply to that area. Hugely important. So when you look, at people like this, I know no one in here is like that, but you may know somebody that you work with. You know, that girl that sits next to you, she looks like that. Okay, so when you're looking at this, that posture is generally adaptive to a trauma. Now, when we look at a normal human skeleton, the head should be lined up over the base. Now, if you've had a trauma and some people have fallen out of a chair or off a slide or something, and they can have some mid-thoracic deviations. So what happens is, when they bend forward, watch, watch the holes where the nerves are. When you bend forward, can you see them that they open up? So this forward body posture is generally protecting those nerves that supply the organ systems. So you can't just go in there and say, sit them straight. Okay, it's like, oh my God, why do they find slouching comfortable? Okay, would, would that make more sense? Because you're looking more for detective work, because nobody on purpose is gonna stand like this, that's completely uncomfortable. Um, and so you've gotta look at the whole body. I know it sounds crazy because we're living in a symptom drug era, okay? Where you got a symptom, you got, a, you got an ill, we got a pill, okay? Except that doesn't really work. Imagine if the body is intelligent and gives symptoms for a reason. And in fact, the muscles that run from the skull all the way down to the sacrum, they're called paravertebrals, 
they're not even under conscious control. You can't tighten them and you can't loosen them. Now, you've got this nerve plexus that comes out of the base of the neck. It's called a brachial plexus. And I think I'm, I'm one of the few guys that graduated like 25 years ago that can still draw it from memory. Okay? I know. I'm like nerd. <laughs> you know, it, you know, you're sitting around, you're thinking, shit, I don't know. Let me draw the brachial plexus. Okay. But it's a nerve plexus that comes out of the base of the neck. So does that mean any kind of trauma, damage to it, you can alter those nerves or compromise it? And this is where like, like stiff necks, things like that. Now, this is a cool article. A Journal of Orthopedic Sports and Physiotherapy, 1995. Now they call it posture in patients with shoulder overuse injuries. And if you ever heard carpal tunnel is a repetitive motion injury. Okay, that's not true. Okay, because there's two people that are doing the same job. They both have a repetitive motion. Only one of them gets it. Why? What they found out was that one person doing the repetitive motion, if they have compromised nerve supply or forward head posture, that it contributed to it. Of course, they, they said further on that they, you know, there was a lot of variables that wasn't really accurate to diagnose forward head carriage or altered deviation as a contributing factor, but it makes sense because you've got the outlet to the thorax. If that head is forward, off to the side, backwards, you're going to compromise the blood supply, nerve supply to the entire structure. It, I mean, it just makes sense. Even the Mayo Clinic. Okay. Okay, good. Thank God somebody remembers, okay, what was a police squad? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. The Mayo Clinic. Okay. Ah, oh, good. Okay, thank God, a contemporary brother. Okay, a forward hunch, hunch posture can cause tendons to become pinched. Eventually, they lead to a tear or rotator cuff. Well, at least they know forward posture, head posture, is a contributing factor to degeneration. Okay, their mechanism action is completely foolish because it doesn't strain tendons. That's ridiculous. Okay, so what kind of things come from the neck? Since we have the brachial plexus, we also got the cardiac and respiratory center. And then you've got this nerve that supplies the diaphragm. So phrenic function, that's from C3, C4, C5. We're looking at 93% of all headaches come from the neck. That's huge. Okay, double crush injuries such as rotator cuff problems, that's a double crush injury. Elbow, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, double crush injury means it's pinched here, causes this problem here. Carpal tunnel syndrome, double crush injury. And, there, and you're talking, this is in the biomechanics Bibles. And so why is the neck so important when we're talking about these injuries? Well, you know, look at headaches. When I get a patient that says, oh, I just have the normal headache. It's like, good God, what a sick society. Okay, what do you think is normal? Okay, well, your body is completely stupid. You're obviously suffering from lack of pharmaceutical products, and it only gives symptoms because you need more drugs. Okay, how, how ridiculous. Imagine if your body is intelligent, built in the image and likeness of God. That would be cool. Okay, it's more energy than matter. That's kind of cool too. Okay, so it gives symptoms for a reason. You get a headache, look at the neck. So these are the ignored, ignored um, causes, okay? Which is interesting because the cause of correcting it would also be the solution. Neurogenic, so we've got nerve compression or some type of altered function. And you're going to learn that the forearm has muscles here, muscles here, and we need a balance of that, okay? Well, you're also going to learn that the shoulder has one bony attachment and the 18 muscles that hold it up here. So there's going to be a neurologic component. Vascular component, why? Because the head's forward or off to the side. Or your blood is toxic and thick, like we've talked about in the past, that under physical, chemical, or emotional stress, you don't have those beautiful red blood cells, so they can't filter out into the joints. This is why diabetics have a lot of joint issues, because all your joints are hydraulic. Mechanical distortions. Anybody in here ever fall off a building, get run over by a car, shot or stabbed? Or am I the only one? Okay, good, good, good. So there are going to be some mechanical distortions, possibly, if you're living in this world, okay, and you've had some trauma. I got, I got a couple of patients that I want to show you. Now, now, this gal wrote back numbness tingling in the legs. Okay, that's what she has. Now, she came in in 2019, and we're seeing way there over there on the left, 
loss of curve, degeneration, and instability. So she had a couple of whiplash traumas. Stayed here for about a month, got the curve back, and reduced the forward head carriage. The top of the neck should be lined up over the bottom. So she went from 24 millimeters to 19 millimeters. Not a big change, but in a month, that's pretty damn good. Okay, comes back two years later. Holy moly, the top bone in the neck is a circle. Okay, and this is the cardiac and respiratory center called the brainstem. If you look straight on, on a circle, you can't see both sides. Okay, what she, what she has in that picture on the outside is it's turned off to the side. So you can actually see the massive rotation at C1. Now, what kind of things does she have? Um, low back pain from a fall, so she had some kind of trauma, neck pain, fatigue, heart palpitations, brain fog. Interesting. Wouldn't you like to see what the front of her looks like? Go on, say it with me. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, the heart has two nerve supplies. You've got parasympathetic up at the base of the neck. You've got sympathetic at the top of the thoracic area. Does that look like she might have had a trauma in the past? Yes or yes? Absolutely. Now, we got a shoulder that has 18 muscles that have guided up and down the rib cage, one bony attachment. Do you think that if you're presented with a shoulder problem that you may want to look at the neck and the thoracic area? Go on. Say, duh. Okay, you know, we're just talking common sense. And can you imagine the orthopedic surgeon that just wants to shoot it with cortisone and not look at the structures? It's like, man, what good programming from the pharmaceutical industry. So let's look at another patient, 33-year-old female, shoulder pain. Um, her shoulders actually had no degeneration, but they were all jammed up. They were impinged. Okay, now you're looking at her neck on the left. It's a reverse curve. To get a reversal of the curve in the neck means you had to injure the posterior longitudinal ligament. So this was a significant whiplash trauma. Now, what I like to do is take a stress x-ray to see if I can correct the problem. I know, I know. You're thinking, God, that's too much common sense. Please slow it down. No, wouldn't you like to say, hey, yeah, we could fix it. And then what are you doing? It Pulling it right out of here? No, we're looking at its post x-ray. So she bends up like this. All the joints are moving. Beautiful. We can get a correction. But also we're looking at neck, fatigue, shoulder pain. Okay, pain between the shoulder blades. No kidding. Her body's like this. Don't you think that that would cause some asymmetrical spasms to try and correct the problem? Now, let's look at bursa. Have you ever heard of bursitis? Okay, okay, let's look at what bursitis is. Okay, bursa sacs. Now, you got a muscle that attaches to a bone via a tendon. So the muscles don't cross the joints, but the tendons do. Okay, now this tendon is going to be in an area where it moves stuff, so there's going to be friction to it. So around that tendon, to ease off the friction, is this sac full of fluid, which is a superfiltrate of blood called bursa fluid. Bursa fluid's in the bursa sac. Now, if you have compromised vascular supply, like let's say you got something in the shoulder, do you think you have healthy blood supply to the bursa sac or compromised blood supply to the bursa sac? Okay, good. Okay, so that means that if that bursa sac doesn't have it because of vascular compromise, forward head carriage, or some other type of problem, then you're not going to have the good fluid production in there, so the tendon rubs together, and then it inflames. And then you say itis, that's inflammation in Latin. So you have bursitis. Now, what's amazing is when you look at this, we know that bursitis comes from lack of fluid. Can you imagine taking a non anti-inflammatory, Advil, Motrin, or Aleve, which decreases the symptoms a little bit, but it also decreases the building block of cartilage called proteoglycan production. And so it's like, damn, that's dumb. Okay, or shooting the joint with cortisone, okay, which you can only shoot it a couple of times because it starts to destroy the joint cartilage and the structures. That's why you want to use heat on bursitis, except for the elbow one. And I'm going to explain that one in a little bit. Because what happens when you put a hot cloth on your, on your arm or shoulder? What, is, what does it turn? It turns red, right? That's because the brain senses that difference in temperature, okay, increases the blood flow to equalize the temperature. So we're artificially elevating the blood pressure in that area, which is going to increase the blood flow, which increases the synovial fluid production and the bursa sac fluid production because we're helping blood to flow there. So you're increasing the inflammation. Wow, what a great idea. But wouldn't it be nice if you corrected the actual cause? 
Now, supraspinatus is the muscle on top of the shoulder, okay, the most commonly injured. And I cannot tell you how many thousands of patients, okay, have come in and they said, Doc, my rotator cuff's damaged and my doctor says it's completely torn and that I need surgery. Okay, well, for one, inflammation distorts an MRI. So if you're utilizing that as your primary guide, that's not smart, okay? Now, the supraspinatus does the first 15 degrees of motion. After that, the deltoid kicks up, and then you have this lateral deviation. So what I'll tell people is I'll say, well, the body position and the MRI can distort the image, so I doubt if it's actually accurate. So I grab a hold of it and hold, it, hold their arm tight to their ribcage area, and I'll say push against it. 100% of the time, so far in over 20 years, I've, there's been a lot of strength there. If you have a totally torn supraspinatus, you're gonna have somebody move their arm like this, okay? They do a little shimmy to kick it out, and then they lift it up so the deltoid can take over. There's no way they're gonna have a huge amount of strength there on the deltoid. And so you gotta look at this that is it, you know, and, and this is a typical thing with doctors, if it doesn't show up in an MRI, the CT scan, or the blood panel, then they're going to touch the patient. No, that's a, that's a medical joke, okay? <laughs> You're supposed to touch the patient first, okay, to find out the freaking problem, okay? But that's, that's why. I mean, the supraspinatus, okay, is at the top. And so that's going to be more predisposed to injuries. Now, you've got a massive deltoid on top, okay, that's always pulling up. And this is why when we see shoulder problems, when any of those rotator cuffs get weak, okay, you've got this little socket in there. It's, it's called a labrum where the, the humerus fits in there and, and it should just hold it nicely, but it's not. It pops up because you have that deltoid. So you have a distorted labrum. And what happens is you're going to see a lot of this in fold and shoulder because if this socket is supposed to be here and it's actually here, when people have a distorted, what they're going to do, instead of lifting their arm like this, they're going to lift it like this, okay? And, and you're going to say, wow, that's bad, okay? It has to do with the torn labrum, okay? And the biceps attaches to the top part of it, so there's a lot of things you can get it. Now, has anyone in here cut their skin ever? Did it heal on its own? Or do you, if you, did you have to say, hey, look, be quiet. i got to think about this. You know. No, it just heals on its own. Same thing with disc injuries. Disc injuries, disc can regenerate, cartilage can regenerate, labrums can heal. But what do you think caused the labrum in the first place? Oh my God, forward head carriage. Altered biomechanics, compromised blood supply or nerve supply. Does that make sense? So you correct the actual problem, you're going to fix the, the, the nerve supply, blood supply, and biomechanics, and then you got to change the shape of the joint. How do you do that? You typically have your palm forward because that's going to derotate out that, that joint so the head of the humerus is facing right in. You kick your chin up. Why? Because you're going to restore the blood supply and nerve supply, and you dangle it. Literally just dangle it. So it drops it down, and you're reforming that socket. Simple thing, but you got to make sure that the neck is working correctly. The absolute worst thing that you could do, the worst thing you could do, imagine if this shoulder is jammed up, distorted labrum, and what do you want to do? You want to get somebody that's really mean to give you full range of motion when it's not in the socket. Absolute worst thing in the do. And, and this is something we wouldn't even tell people to do overhead lifting for at least a couple of weeks while they're reforming the labor. So what do you do for the shoulder? Number one, no end range of motion, okay, until, until you get that labor stabilized. No shoulder rehab without cervical and thoracic correction because that'd be foolish. I mean, if you got a, an altered neck thing or an altered rib cage area, the thoracic area, and you know that that shoulder has 18 muscles that guide and glide it up and down, you know, why would you want to do any exercises before you got good blood supply and nerve supply to the joint? I mean, that just makes sense. Uh, correct the forward head carriage, no ice and chronic shoulder injuries, heat would be ideal. Now, this bursa is the electrodon burst. It's right at the elbow. And I got a couple of elbow pictures there, which is hugely important. Now, this is super common in gout, um, diabetes, and direct trauma. So if you're sitting like this all day long, you can damage that electrodon bursa. 
So now bursa sacs, okay, you have fluid flowing into it, producing the bursa fluid. You move it around and the fluid flows out. So if you have a sac that's swelling up more and more, is that a problem with blood flow flowing in or blood flow flowing out? Let's just look at common sense. Okay, does that make sense? So this is one that you're going to use some kinesio tape or some type of back pressure on it to create that pressure and then move it gently. But you also got to fix the blood because the valves in that bursa sac are only going to get clogged if the blood's under stress state. Particularly certain procedures now are actually damaging the blood. It's starting to clot it. We can see microclots on the, on the blood analysis. But you need to keep that back pressure. Now, if you just use heat on this, you already got a bunch of blood flow into the area. That would be uncomfortable. So ice and compression are a good idea. And then you got to do gentle movements, not complete and range of motion. But you've got to fix the blood. Because remember, this giant olecranon bursa is not a problem of the elbow. It's in a symptom of the elbow, an alarm of the elbow, not a problem of the elbow. Okay, does, does that make sense? You've got to fix the actual problem. Now, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. You got muscles on one side called flexors. You got muscles on the other side called extensors. Now, strength ratio, it should be a five to four ratio where these are almost as strong as these. Now, we're not making fishing nets anymore. Okay, you're pretty much sitting down, grabbing a briefcase, typing a computer or something. You're not utilizing both. Okay, now you've got two bones here. One is the hinge. That's the ulnar. And you can see that on the bottom there, how it just goes right around there. The other one is the radius. Okay, and think of like radial tires, where you turn it and right at the elbow, it pivots. Now, when you get up, now I didn't have a full arm with a hand, so that's one, other, one patient's hand with another patient's elbow. Okay, so if you're thinking, that doesn't look exactly right, because it, it's not. <laughs> I took a couple of patients to do what I needed to do. Okay, but what you're gonna see, and this is hugely important when we look at the biomechanics, the radius is small here, because it pivots, and big here, because that's the pad. And so when people fall, okay, or jam, they typically fracture that radius. But then you've got the other bone that just does the pivoting, okay? So the, the pivoting bone doesn't turn. The turning bone pivots going up and down. So now when you're talking about muscle balance, typically there's going to be a muscle balance where the flexors are way more strong than the extensor. So you've got to get to a corrective chiropractor because I'm saying like 70, 80% of the time, the ulnar, which is the bone that does the hinge, is medially displaced because the strength of all of the flexors are going to this medial epicondyle, and that's the flexor epicondyle. So you've got to know somebody that can test this and correct it. We use a muscle test, testing um, the triceps this way, then we'll flex it, test the flexor epicondyle, still testing triceps. If that's weak, the ulnar is going to be put in place. If it's extensor, you're checking the radial head or the extensor epicondyle. And that's all technical doctor stuff that we talk about in our adjusting videos. Just find somebody sharp enough to know how to assess it and fix it. Okay. Or you get a blind guy that's stupid that just shoots with cortisone. Wait, no, that wouldn't make sense, would it? Okay, because you got to restore the nerve supply to it. So if you're looking at golf or a tennis elbow, you got to look at the neck, forward head carriage, and the muscle. Now, when we're looking at this, and this is, again, a great view, so you can understand that the radius is real wide here, small here, and the ulnar is real small here and a great pivot here. So we want, you want to get the biomechanics of that. Now, when we're doing human dissection, you could literally open up the carpal tunnel and you could stick a dime in, okay, in a, in a grown man's hand. Okay, so it's that big. So think of that. Now, what happens is in carpal tunnel, the flexors are way stronger than the extensors. So the flexors, the muscles here, flatten out the tunnel, putting pressure on the median nerve. Now, see that band of tissue that goes around it? Well, this is called the extensor and flexor retinaculum. So it's, it looks kind of like a tennis bracelet, doesn't it? So in crazy, stupid world, we wouldn't look at the neck. We wouldn't look at the muscle balance. We would just go in there with a knife if there's pressure on the median nerve and cut that flexor retinaculum. I know. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, that's why people that have carpal tunnel surgery, in one hand, they typically got to have it in the other hand. 
because they're not addressing the primary cause, which is the neck. So if this is coming in from that muscle imbalance, the correction would be to strengthen the muscles on the back so it puts a greater pressure on the top of that tunnel, taking pressure off the median nerve. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? And it's got to make sense. So we're looking at reverse curve to normal curve. Okay, this is the same patient. Okay, and, we're, and you're going to see a lot of these corrections are done in two to four weeks, but that's because our protocols are really aggressive. We see people, three adjustments a day, we'll separate them by a couple of hours, give them cross-crawl exercises in between, so, you know, we get fast results. Okay, before and after, again, before and after. Now, this one, I wanted to take note because see the picture on the right there? I marked the hard palate, and what you want to do, and this is why I'm so picky about the films, is that palate can move about 15 degrees without affecting the cervical curve. Now, this one's borderline. Okay, it's about 16, 17 degrees, where if you go like this, you're going to get a curve. Okay, so if you're doing pre and post x-rays, you got to have that palate level. Now, how do we get the curve back in the neck? Because knowing that the cervical spine is absolutely intimately connected, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, everything. Well, I have this miracle device that I invented, okay, over 20 years ago. Why? Because when I was teaching the biomechanics lab, we would get a towel and put it around people. So I'd ask patients to bring in a towel. Okay, guess the variety of towels that they brought in. Okay, you couldn't get symmetry. So this is inch or three quarter inch pipe insulation surrounded by, by a, a nylon covering with a hunk of webbing. Why? Because back in the 70s, we did a lot of rock climbing, so I'm familiar with webbing. Uh, I'm very familiar with contracting, so I got a plumber's thing in there because it works really good. And you pull it, not out, straight down with about two pounds of pressure. And then you do not look back. You look up. And the reason this is only providing a pivot, so many people, when they got a neck problem, they go, God, Doc, it used to hurt and it doesn't hurt at all. This is amazing. I don't need to see you at all. And it's like, dude, the neck ain't here, okay? So you got to isolate it and you just pull down with about one kilo of pressure, two pounds, look up, look straight ahead and relax, up, straight ahead and relax. Typically, we'll tell people to do this for about, you know, 100, 150 a day. Had a patient, okay, and this is something, and anybody in here work with people? Okay, have you ever had something you say not be received? That's not what you told me, okay? So I had a patient come in, she was a nurse, and she said, I'm doing it just the way you told me and my neck hurts every time. I said, no, that's really unusual, I don't think so. I do it just the way you did. And she's getting more and more and more pissed off. So she says, just like this, that's what I said. I said that's, okay, so you gotta take a deep breath and you gotta say, well, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> Not like, good God. <laughs> so you just got to like watch it out. Also, you'll see her going like that, like laying on the table. You could also do this at a desk. Okay. If you're working there for hours, put your elbows on the desk, lift your chin up, not back and deep breathe. Why deep breathe? Because deep breathing increases intrathecal pressure and forces fluid into those discs. The discs are 70% fluid too. I mean, they work really, really well. You can look at our cervical adjusting videos. When we're adjusting, you do not want to turn the head a whole bunch. You'll see this guy here. His head is turned no more than 10 to 15 degrees. Why? Because the more you turn that head, the more you're going to initiate these sensors. And you've got three sensors on the spine. One's a joint mechanoreceptor. One are in muscle spindles. And then even the ligaments got sensory input. So the more you stimulate that, the more the muscles tighten up. So there's a way to correct it um, correctly. Now, this is how to correct the main body. Now, I know it seems extravagant, but I buy these by the bag. They're number 32 rubber bands, okay? I call them wrist resistance extension devices. Yeah, I know. There's some guy out there billing 35 bucks per, for insurance. I don't take insurance. Okay, so what you do is you put it around like a flower bud, then you make it into a claw. Power bud to claw. Now, what I mean is, it's not like this. It's not like this. Okay. It's not like this. Okay. I have people do that. No, it's simpler than that. It's just flower bud to claw because you're only working these extensors. 
Now, the biggest guy I've ever worked on, and this guy's, I mean, James Colossus Thompson. I mean, his arms, honest to God, were bigger than a normal man's legs. And he was a mixed MMA fighter, really, really good. And I gave him this exercise, and along with correcting the neck, and, you know, it helped a bit. Yeah, but where this goes, this is super important because you've got to do this to fatigue. And anybody want to try it? Yeah, I was a paper boy. You saw that zip by your head right to my nephew. <laughs> Herald Examiner, the Valley area. So now, what causes carpal tunnel? Compression of the median nerve. Now, what causes it is a double crush injury beginning in the neck leading to a muscle imbalance of the forearm. You know how you make a muscle imbalance worse? Brace it. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to take the pressure off. Now remember, there's a tunnel here. So if you put your thumb and pinky together, see how it makes like a little tunnel? Now you want to put, and now this is really neat. It's flexible, okay, it's cheap, and it doesn't stick to fur, okay, but it will stick to itself. So you put your thumb and pinky together. It's got to be placed around the base of the metacarpals. Okay, now this is not over the wrist bones. So I put uh, the x-ray of the hand there so it's not around the wrist bones. Okay, and you don't need to make it really tight. And so this way you have full range of motion, but look at that, it holds a tunnel there. So if your hand is waking you up at night or anything else, simple, easy, nice solution. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And I wish more people wanted rubber bands. I was all set to shoot people. <laughs> so what do you do for cervical, elbow, and wrist injuries? Okay, number one, get a full set of x-rays, a uh, full series, cervical and thoracic spine. That's just common sense. You got to see what the structures you're working with. Um, restore the cervical curve, restore the labrum. Because, I mean, you got to look. Uh, do you have carpal tunnel syndrome? Should you look at the labrum? Yes. Why? Because both are going to have an issue. Do you want to wait till they have the symptoms? No. Look at it now. Okay? Be like a complete doctor. Although, with the psychotic world we got now, they're not looking at the overall health because doctors are not responsible for you. Okay? I am responsible for my patients. Um, get the la labrum working correctly. Restore the muscle balance. Stabilize the wrist. Restore the lumbar lordosis. And this is one of the things we have to do because if you're sitting like this, okay, the head is forward. We use this at the junction of the rib cage and low back to restore the lordata curve, and that repositions and takes a lot of press, uh, pressure off the upper thoracic area. Um, I get proper supplements and nutrition. Why? Because your joints are hydraulic. You need to have healthy blood supply to it. Eliminate prescriptions that are toxic, and that means you've got to find out why you're taking the drug, okay, and then correct it, and then get deep sleep. That's, that's why we put this up here. On every event, you need to have good nerve supply. You need to have good exercise because movement helps the whole body. It helps the brain. If man makes it, you don't eat it. So proper nutrition, sufficient rest and prayer and meditation. I know what you're worried about. You, I know and you guys too. You, haven't, you don't see masking on social distancing here. Okay, no, I'm talking about human beings. Okay. Now. We're ending the portion that, um, if you're watching Dr. B by P, you'll see this uninterrupted. Um, we have to go into a subject matter that I think might be a challenge with today's censorship world, okay? And you could call it tyranny or tyranny or, or whatever you want, but it's, it's just a, a social environment that if you want to control the population, you want to control the information. So we're going into the next area of uncontrolled thought. So I'll see you next week, and we've got, we, I actually um, got a really good plan next week. Okay, yeah, you're, you're going to like the show next week, because it's going to be um, uh, really good on how to heal the intestinal tract.